and we are back for episode 5.3. Our episode begins with statues of various gods inside the House of Black and White. We have the Weeping Lady of Lice, the Lion of Night from E.T., the Black Goat of Cahor, the Stranger from the Faith of the Seven. All of these statues are in the book, and then the show adds a few new gods to the Pantheon. The Old Gods, R'hllor, the Drowned God. These aren't traditionally death gods in the book, and it's difficult to say if the religion of the Many-Faced God would consider them as such. That said, in the book, Jack and Hagar does once mention that the Red God is owed lives when Arya saves him, Rorg, and Biter from the fire. And the Kindly Man does say that him of many faces comes for worshippers of the Drowned God and R'hllor as well. Curiously, in the book, the cult never mentions the Old Gods. Perhaps it's because followers of the Old Gods do live forever in the Werewood Net. Next, we have Jack and Hagar offering a man some poison water. Now, poison water is part of the House of Black and White in the book, though people tend to just get it themselves. Arya does offer some poison water to a stabbed man when she first arrives at the house, but she doesn't really understand what she's doing. Now, here in the show, Arya seems quite upset about the secrecy of the house and the boredom and monotony of her new chores. This is actually not a thing in the book. Arya is pretty content doing chores at the house and finds it sort of comforting because she's with a family of sorts. And almost immediately, the kindly man starts involving her in religious activities. They teach her about the tenets of the religion, they give her psychotropic drugs in the form of scented candles, and they perhaps start feeding her human meat. Or at least Arya fears they are. Next we have Cersei upset about the wedding of Tommen and Marjorie. Now, as in the book, a rivalry is growing between Cersei and Marjorie, but the book rivalry is much more one-sided. Cersei becomes paranoid over time from her reoccurring dreams about Maggie the Frog. During the wedding in the book, Cersei actually directly thinks about whether Marjorie could be the younger queen who topples her in the Maggie the Frog prophecy. She decides at that time that Marjorie isn't more beautiful, which is also part of the prophecy, and therefore the prophecy isn't coming true. This, of course, later changes. Now, as in the book, Tommen's wedding is a much more modest affair than Joffrey's wedding. So to add a little spectacle to the event, Cersei orders the burning of the Tower of the Hand with wildfire, which occurs at roughly the same time as Mance's burning at the wall. Now, this is actually Cersei's second order of wildfire. In the book, it's her idea to use wildfire at the Blackwater, something switched to Tyrion in the show. Additionally, Cersei considers having the lead pyromancer act as Hand, despite the fact that she thinks the pyromancers are a bit insane. Whether Cersei will continue down her path using wildfire in the book is unknown, but there is certainly quite a bit of evidence for it. Next, here in the show, we get an extra scene of Marjorie manipulating Tommen romantically and sexually to get him to try to send Cersei back to Casterly Rock. Now, this suggestion of returning to Casterly Rock goes over quite poorly with Cersei, and we get some serious tension between Marjorie and Cersei here in the show. Now, in the book, Tommen is a boy of eight, so there is no romantic or sexual manipulation of Tommen in the books, and the Tyrells are not so nearly overt as they are in the show. Marjorie does try to win over Tommen's affections by giving him some kittens, and she does say to Tommen that he should sit on the small council so he can learn to be a king. It's hard to say whether these actions are innocuous or some sort of long-term subtle manipulation, but Cersei certainly overreacts to them because she's going insane from her dreams. Show Marjorie is rather overt and fast-acting in her power play. Next, we have an extra scene of Theon walking around Winterfell during its reconstruction, he seems spooked by some flayed people, and we get a shot of a raven eating a body. Now, it should be noted that in the book, the Boltons don't really want Winterfell, but reluctantly end up there anyway. Bruce has the Dreadfort and is Warden of the North, and Ramsay is Lord of Hornwood and expects to inherit the Dreadfort after Roos. Winterfell is a ruin, and the reason they eventually go there and try to reconstruct it is primarily to lure Stannis there. The Boltons had hoped that Stannis would foolishly march on the Dreadfort, but thanks to Jon's advice, Stannis doesn't take the bait and instead marches on Deepwood Mott to attack the Ironborn. Roose figures that a wedding between Ramsay and Arya Stark would be highly symbolic and too irresistible for Stannis, and so they go to Winterfell to hold the wedding there. The reconstruction of Winterfell that Roose orders before the wedding is quick and shoddy, though. It's very clear that no one plans on keeping this castle. And weirdly, the workers are executed afterwards for some reason, which perhaps suggests that there is something secret about the reconstruction that's going on. Perhaps buildings that are ready to collapse to take out allies who might turn on them? Now, with regard to ravens, in the books, ravens and weirwoods start paying a lot more attention to Theon once he returns to Winterfell, even talking to him. 
These werewoods and ravens are likely secretly Bran and Bloodraven. What exactly they want with Theon is still unclear. Next, we have an extra scene where Roos and Ramsay discuss their hold on the North. Ramsay tells a story of how he flayed a man for not paying his taxes, and Roos seems disappointed with Ramsay's tactics, before telling him that he has a marriage for Ramsay to help them secure the North. That marriage, here in the show, is to Sansa. Now in the book, Roos and Ramsay definitely have their issues with each other, and it's difficult to make sense of their relationship. It's complicated to say the least. But as here in the show, Book Roos does seem disappointed that Ramsay is uncontrollable. In the book, Roos even claims that Ramsay murdered his trueborn son, Domeric, which makes his tolerance of Ramsay all the more curious. Now in the book, the marriage of Ramsay to a Stark, that is, Jane Poole posing as Arya Stark, goes back at least to the third book. It was likely part of Roos Bolton's deal for betraying Rob Stark. There is actually quite a bit of dizzying calculus about the whole wedding deal. Littlefinger took Jane Poole into his custody after Ned's failed coup and started training her quite brutally as a sex worker. Littlefinger then, being oh so useful, hands over Jane to Tywin, who gives her to Roose Bolton to help him secure his hold on the North as a fake Arya. Jane being fake, though, and the Lannisters knowing this, ensures Bolton loyalty. Should the Boltons turn on the Lannisters, they can announce that Arya is a fake. And quite importantly, this deal was made when the Lannisters still had Sansa, so Roos is essentially not getting very much in the deal. But, being the troublemaker that he is, Littlefinger steals Sansa, thus making this fake Arya into the person that actually inherits Winterfell. Suddenly, it's the Boltons who are getting Winterfell by marriage when it was supposed to be a Lannister possession. Let's remember that Tyrell Lannister fighting over Sansa and Winterfell did occupy much of the third book in the third season. Now, the Boltons suddenly getting Winterfell probably would have made Tywin quite angry, but in a stroke of luck for the Lannister-Bolton alliance, Tywin dies, and Cersei doesn't care at all. Cersei is perfectly content with the Boltons having Winterfell, even though, as we said, the Boltons don't even seem to want Winterfell. Now, as complicated as much of that was, the book logic mostly makes sense. The show, on the other hand... Well, this is perhaps the most illogical move that the show has ever done. Here in the show, we find Littlefinger and Sansa at Moat Kaelin, and despite Littlefinger putting in quite a bit of effort to acquire Sansa, he's now giving her away to marry Ramsay Bolton for some reason. And Sansa accepts the deal despite Roose Bolton betraying and killing her brother. And the Boltons accept the deal even though it means making enemies of the Lannisters. Sansa is believed by the Lannisters to have helped kill Joffrey. The show tries to justify things with talk of Sansa taking charge of her life, but the move is so odd that even the most casual of fans were perplexed by it, my mother included. Next, we have an extra scene of Brienne and Pod who have been following Sansa. Now, in the book, Brienne is specifically told by Jaime that Arya is a fake and to not go following her up north, and so she doesn't. Here in the show, they head up north and opt to go around Moat Kaelin, something that simply isn't possible in the book. Podrick and Brienne then tell a bit of their backstories. Here in the show, Pod says that he was attached to a knight who stole a ham and was hanged for it. Pod shared the ham, but because his last name was Payne, he was spared. This is more or less Pod's backstory in the book as well, though here in the show it's Tywin who sends him to Squire for Tyrion, but in the books it's Kevin Lannister. Now Brienne's story, on the other hand, is quite different. So here in the show, Brienne tells Pod a tale of why she likes Renly, which essentially amounts to men laughing at her at a ball and Renly stepping in to dance with her. Her love for him is platonic, and she knew that he didn't have romantic feelings for her because he was gay. Now in the book, Brienne has a very different backstory that includes huge complicated questions about gender roles and feminism. First off, in the book, Brienne's love for Renly is much more naive, and she is 100% absolutely in love with Renly romantically. She is seemingly unaware that Renly is gay, as in the book, Renly's sexual preference is not so famously known as it is in the show. So book Brienne is quite haunted by painful memories. Brienne is both ugly and refusing to be subservient to men, which gives her little agency in sexist Westeros and makes it difficult to marry her off. She then falls in love with Renly because he treats her like a proper lady with traditional courtesy and dances with her. Brienne then chooses to follow Renly into war because she's in love with him. Of course, Brienne's love for Renly and liking being treated like a proper lady is likely an intentional contradiction inserted by our author. Brienne, on the one hand, rejects traditional gender roles, but then on the other hand, still wants the seemingly benevolent parts of those traditional gender roles. 
It's a ridiculous dream that can never be achieved, and that's the whole point. It's just as ridiculous as falling in love with a gay man and hoping for reciprocity. Brienne's journey, much like Arya, Danny, and Cersei's, is in many ways about what happens when one moves past traditional gender roles. There is another incident that Brienne is haunted by in the book, which does involve men playing a game and laughing at her. When Brienne is part of Renly's guard, various men make bets on who can take Brienne's virginity, with different men trying to woo her by singing her songs, sending her flowers, and trying to seduce her. It's a character named Heil Hunt who makes the biggest inroads by training with her, that is, treating her as an equal. The game is discovered and stopped by Sam's dad, Randall Tarley, and Brienne ends up hating all of the men involved. However, she does end up running into and traveling with Heil Hunt again, who despite being a bit of an ass, appears to actually like Brienne and wants to marry her for her castle. Meanwhile, up at the wall, we get a scene with Stannis and Jon where Jon rejects Stannis' offer to be made Lord of Winterfell. In the book, we never see Jon's first rejection, but we have a scene where Stannis asks a second time and is rejected again. Now here Jon asks Stannis if he will be staying long because food is an issue at the wall. Dwindling food supplies is a huge issue in the book, one that most definitely contributes to Jon getting stabbed. However, book Jon never has the gall to confront Stannis about it. Now here in the show, Stannis mentions that he's leaving behind his wildling captives because he doesn't want them. Again, in the book, Stannis' whole point for coming north is to utilize and integrate wildlings into his army. Not wanting to see the wildlings slaughtered, Book John convinces Stannis to leave the wildlings behind in exchange for information on how to get more recruits for his army. Stannis agrees, and John tells him to ask the Mountain Clans for help before his attack on the Ironborn at Deepwood Mott. Now this is all finished off with an extra scene of Davos telling John that he has potential and can make a difference in the world. Of course, in the book, John and Davos have never met, and at this point in the book, Davos has gone to White Harbor to treat with the Manderleys. He has his own adventures, which mostly involve being captured and put in prison, but it all ends with the Manderleys revealing that they have Theon's squire, a boy named Wex, who knows where Rickon is. They command Davos to go to the island of Skagos to find Rickon in exchange for homage. Next, we have an extra scene of Arya and the Waif getting into an argument, causing Jockin to enter, and forcing Arya to give up her possessions. Arya throws everything away, but hides her most prized possession, Needle. After throwing away her possessions, she's promoted to the job of washing bodies. Now in the book, there is no antagonistic relationship between Arya and the Waif. The Waif shows no hatred towards Arya, and never expresses any belief that she shouldn't be in the House of Black and White. The kindly man, though, does order Arya to get rid of all of her possessions, and Arya, as in the show, throws everything away except for Needle. Now there is some question to whether or not the House of Black and White knows that Arya is failing to ditch her past. When they later give her identities to assume, she usually chooses elements from her own history, like Beth, Nymeria, and most notably, her mother's name, Cat. Additionally, Arya is not very secretive when she hides her sword, and she even speaks to herself aloud while doing it. Next, we head back up to Winterfell for an extra scene with Sansa being introduced to Roose and Ramsay, while the show-only character Miranda looks on. Then a servant woman tells Sansa that the North remembers. Now, the North remembers is a line repeated several times in the book, though it mostly refers to vengeance and not stark sentimentality. Next, we have an extra scene where John names a latrine captain and names Alistair Thorne First Ranger. John does no such thing in the book, and Alistair, despite nominally being a ranger, doesn't seem to actually like ranging and curses John for sending him out. This is followed by a scene from the book where John assigns Janus Slint the job of restoring the castle of Greyguard. Janus Slint refuses the job, but it's not quite clear why. It seems he thinks the job is beneath him, but at the same time, he thinks he'll die there. John then chooses to execute Janus for his insubordination, and there's a bit of karma here as Janus had a role in killing Ned, though we have no evidence that John knew about Janus's involvement. Now in the book, there is a whole lot more going on, much within the mind of John, that explains this scene. And there's a whole lot of secretive stuff going on with Janus that explains why he's acting the way he is. So in the book, John knows that restoring Greyguard is a hellish job, which is why he's assigning it to Slint as punishment for Slint throwing him in the ice cells for four days. But it's not hard work or cold nights that Slint is worried about. Janus Slint describes sending him to Greyguard as John's scheme. There's a reason why John is restoring Greyguard. Stannis ordered him to. 
and there's rumors going around that these castles are going to be given to wildling chieftains. And Janice Slint actually writes King's Landing and warns them that Stannis is making common cause with the wildlings. It seems that in Slint's mind, Jon is forcing him to aid Stannis and look like a Stannis crony by restoring one of these castles for Stannis to give to the wildlings. And Slint's communication with King's Landing also explains why he's so overconfident in this scene. Slint is a Lannister man, and he assumes people know he's a Lannister man. He thinks Jon won't kill him because it would risk offending King's Landing, and thinks King's Landing will somehow help him. Of course, he's wrong. Now in the book, we get a full page of Jon's inner dialogue with regard to Slint's punishment. We learn, in truth, punitive duty or the ice cells would be the proper response to insubordination. But in the end, Jon rejects those punishments for various reasons and executes Slint almost certainly for personal reasons. Slint threw him in the ice cells for four days, but also spent plenty of time insulting his father. The use of a chopping block rather than a rope puts an exclamation point on the fact that this execution is family related. Now in both book and show, Stannis takes note of Jon's action. Many people see this as approval or respect from Stannis, but a dispassionate look at this scene reveals that Jon has a temper and can be exploited and has a weak spot for his family. Next, we have an extra scene where the High Septon is enjoying a brothel before being dragged out by the Sparrow Movement and punished in the streets. The High Septon goes to complain, and Cersei throws him into a dungeon and lets the Sparrow leader know that she's done him a favor. Now, in the book, it's actually Cersei who orders the murder of the High Septon because she fears that Lancel has spilled the beans to him about their sexual relationship and the murder of Robert. In the book, the High Sparrow actually rises to his position without Cersei's influence. Rather spontaneously, thousands of sparrows arrive in the city, complaining that there's no protection for the faith from groups like the Brave Companions, the Mountain's Men, or the Karstarks. The Sparrow Movement does grab a contender that wants to be High Septon and drags him out to the street, but they never do it to the High Septon himself. They end up storming the Great Sept and forcing the election of the High Sparrow as High Septon. Next, we have an extra scene where Cersei visits Kyburn down in his laboratory to have him send a letter to Littlefinger and we see that Kyburn is making progress on his monster. So the book is a great deal darker when it comes to Kyburn's shenanigans. Cersei actually gives various women to Kyburn, who are then used up somehow to facilitate the creation of his monster. The details aren't really given. We don't know if they're just being drained of their blood or if they're being slowly mutilated. Whatever the case, it's a nightmarish situation, and even Cersei doesn't like thinking about it, though she still gives people over to him. Then we get an extra scene up north where Ramsay assures Littlefinger that Sansa is in good hands, and Littlefinger admits that he doesn't know very much about Ramsay. Of course, in the book, Littlefinger knows the backstory about almost everyone, and Ramsay is fairly notorious. After mailing several pieces of Theon to people and raping and murdering Lady Hornwood, everyone in the kingdom is well aware of what a horrible person Ramsay is. This is followed up with an extra discussion between Roos and Littlefinger about the legality of Sansa's marriage to Ramsay. Here in the show, Sansa's marriage wasn't consummated and therefore not official. Now in the book, it takes a bit more to undo a marriage. The High Septon must step in and dissolve the marriage for it to be undone. This essentially means in the book, Littlefinger needs Tyrion to die if he hopes to marry Sansa or marry Sansa off. Now here, Littlefinger assures Roos about Sansa's virginity, and Roos doesn't really care, which is fairly consistent with Book Roos's feelings about Jane Poole's virginity. Jane Poole was sadly likely raped repeatedly in her training at Littlefinger's brothel, and is certainly no longer a virgin. Next, we return to Tyrion's trip to Volantis. Here in the show, Tyrion becomes stir-crazy and insists on getting out and seeing the city. They pass by the slave population and see a red priestess speak about how Daenerys is the chosen one, Azor Ahai, who will save the world. And then Tyrion heads to a brothel that has a sex worker dressed up as Daenerys. Jorah happens to be at this brothel as well. Tyrion then flirts with a different sex worker, and when she's ready to sleep with him, he all of a sudden decides that he doesn't want to. While urinating, Tyrion is then captured by Jorah and told that he's being brought to the Queen. So in the book, Tyrion's riverboat stops in a city before Volantis called Selhoris. It's there that Tyrion and Aegon Targaryen's tutor, Halden Halfmaester, go to speak to a customs officer about news and gossip. In the book, quite a bit of time is dedicated to exposition about Volantine politics that have yet to play out in our story. Essentially, Volantis is a massive slave city with pro-war and anti-war factions, but it also contains a whole lot of R'hllor worshippers who think Danny is the messiah 
and slaves who want to be freed by her. Volantis is a tinderbox ready to flare up. Anyway, on the way to see this customs officer in Selhoris, they do pass by a red priest who speaks of Danny being Azora High. And as in the book, Tyrion is allowed to visit a brothel, but in the brothel he ends up with a woman who looks at him with revulsion, and he has sex with her anyway. In fact, he has sex with her, vomits on the floor causing her to scream, and then has sex with her again. It's when Tyrion is coming back downstairs that Jorah spots him, and it's Jorah that has the Daenerys clone sex worker in his lap. As in the book, Jorah captures Tyrion and tells him that he's going to bring him to the Queen. And that's all for episode 5.3. See you in episode 5.4.